sao in ring shring ka e la ring asang ka hala ring taka la ring sao ain kling ring shring Namaste. So yesterday, <laughs> this is such an incredible thing for me. We did a video on the different stages of being and how they reflect as consciousness and, of course, the upadis and all of that stuff. And then Zecho. I think I'm pronouncing it right. Let me know if I'm not. Zecho made a comment which somehow got deleted. I hope he can repost it because it was the most amazing comment I've ever gotten on any video in the seven years since doing this channel. See, basically, underneath all of the stuff that we do, there's a concept called the esoteric teaching. And the esoteric teaching is the idea that reality is the way it is. Huh? And then there are different ways of describing it or different ways of looking at it from different points of view. And therefore, if anyone penetrates deeply enough into reality, their description is going to be basically similar to the other descriptions of the other teachers. So you have the Vedas, and you have the Buddha's teaching, you have the Jaina teaching, and you know many other, like Taoists and, and all kinds of different flavors of those main teachings. And although they superficially seem to disagree, Actually, that's just an artifact of semantics, of terminology. And if you really go into them and analyze them ontologically, they all point to the same reality. Now, the thing that I was pursuing for many years was what is the uh, system of coordinates that ties this whole thing together? so that we can see the truth through any of the different uh, schools of thought or disciplines. And we made a great breakthrough, you know, just a year ago or so, when we found out about the four darshanams, chatur darshanam, the four views or points of view given by Shankaracharya in his commentary on Vedanta Sutra, the Sariraka Bhasya. So that's what we were talking about in many of the previous series. But in this recent series, we're trying to give the most high level view that covers the, the most ground and gives you the kind of background, the kind of ontology with which you can decode and understand any of these teachings and get the benefits meaning do the practice. <laughs> so last time we talked about four levels of being. Brahman, Ishwara, Kutashta, or Paramatma, and Jivatma. And then we talked about the Upadis, or superimposition, or limiting adjunct, and the Visheshana, or the particularization or individuation of the different entities from Brahman or within Brahman <laughs> or appearance uh, of such within Brahman. And then Zecho wrote a wonderful comment. I, I hope he can repost it because it was brilliant, huh? where he extended that further into the Buddha's teaching and he brought in Jain logic, uh, Jain seven-valued logic into it, 
which is wonderful because I don't know any of the other viewers who have understood that. We only did a couple of videos on it, but I've been using it uh, and it was very helpful for me to understand this view of the esoteric teaching. So let's go over these four views, the Chatur Darshanam again, and try to understand how that meshes or merges or connects with these four states of being that we talked about. So let's take a look at the ontology of the esoteric teaching. And we're going to look at the darshanam, the view, the yoga, or the method of sadhana connected with that view, the level of being, similar to the topics of the previous video, that you realize when you do these yogas, and then we're going to extend it to the corresponding noble truth of the Buddha's teaching. So, of course, the highest view is ajatavada. Ajata means unborn. So the truth or the point of view that everything that exists is actually unborn, this is the view of jnana yoga. And jnana, of course, lets us access Brahman, which is pure awareness. And the noble truth connected with that is the end of suffering. Actually, the third noble truth in most presentations. Then there's the Vivartavada. Now, Vivartavada is the uh, preferred platform of teaching for Advaita. So Ramana Maharshi, Sripad Shankaracharya, uh, they're all teaching on the Vivartavada. And the Vivartavada, the yoga is Raja Yoga or meditation. Meditation, not in the sense of concentrating on a specific object, but in the sense of realizing a certain level of being. And what is that being? It's the level of Ishwara, the creator, Shiva. So when you realize Shiva, hum, huh? Shiva, aham, I am Shiva. It doesn't mean that you are the creator. <laughs> It means that your consciousness is on the same level. You're looking at things from the same point of view. Therefore, you have a, uh, an affinity or an identification with the Creator. And what is that? That is the path to the end of suffering. The sadhana that brings one to realization of Brahma, which in Buddha's teaching is called Nibbana or Nirvana. And then we have the Vishishtadvaita Vada. Vishishtadvaita means conditional non-duality. Vishishta, Advaita. And Vada, of course, means a system of belief, a philosophical view, or a point of view. Vishishtadvaita Vada is the natural platform for Bhakti. Bhakti means development of love, for a transcendental object. Transcendental means non-dual. So in this level of realization, we come to realize the kutashta, the super soul. The super soul or kutashta, Karnadakshai Vishnu, means the repository or the amalgamation of all the jiva souls, all the individual living beings. And this is still transcendental, okay? Vishnu is fully Brahman realized. He knows that he is nothing but Brahman and that his apparent individuality is only a superimposition. In that way, he's similar to Shiva. But he also has the ignorance of identifying himself with the universe, with the creation and the living beings. And so his job is to maintain the universe. That's Vishnu's role in the creation. However, the noble truth that's connected with that stage is the cause of suffering. This identification, this ignorance, 
is the cause of suffering. And although for Vishnu, it's only an upadi, which means that he can transcend it, still, it causes him a lot of trouble. You know, he has to he has to incarnate in all these different species of life. He has to fight all these demons. He has to create so many religions and scriptures and stuff like that to keep us from going completely crazy. <laughs> it's a tough job, but somebody's got to do it, right? So he's the great hero. He is the template or the example of the greatest hero in the universe. And that's why he says, everyone follows my path in all respects. He says in Bhagavad Gita. So anyway, then we have the Dvaita Vada. Dvaita means duality, two, two-ness or duality. I and thou, subject and object, the seer and the seen. And this is the state that most of us find ourselves in most of the time. <laughs> and so the appropriate mm, sadhana for this state is karma yoga, because karma yoga means actions with the body. And that's why we're called jiva, because jiva means that which is born. So what is born? The body. Certainly Brahman is not born or Vishnu or Shiva. But the Jiva thinks I am born and therefore he has to die. So karma yoga is the action with the body that's designed to cleanse the karma to make us able to see these things and to take actions that will lead to good fortune in the future. And of course, the noble truth connected with this is the noble truth of suffering. Because to be in duality is to suffer. To think that one is the body is to suffer. To be born and have to work to maintain yourself and then die and be reborn again, that's suffering. Okay, so all these things, the, all these uh, qualities of the state of being, of the jiva, jivatma, they're suffering. But we're, we're jiva, but we're also atma, you see? Atma ultimately means Brahman. So here is the, the, the state of being of the human condition, which even great sages have difficulty to understand. And what is that? It's that within this body, there is Brahman. We are sentient beings. That means we're conscious. And behind consciousness is awareness. And awareness is what is Brahman. Uh, so Brahman is there, but then Brahman gets covered over by all these upadis, you see. And in the sense of the jivas, it's even worse because the ignorance becomes the avidya, that makes us think that we are the body, is a visheshana. It's actually part and parcel of our uh, state of being, of our nature. So in the jivatma stage, even though we identify with the body, we can perform activities that lead toward liberation. How is that? It's activities that are in relation with a transcendental object, service to God, following the principles of the scriptures, performing sacrifice. And sacrifice can be anything from going to the temple and offering a leaf of fruit, a flower, or some milk, or even just some water, all the way up to offering the consciousness into the fire of the controlled mind. Uh, that's my favorite. <laughs> so sacrifice is necessary. Uh, otherwise, we become co even more covered over and we find ourselves in the animal species, which is hellish. At least in the human species, we have enough intelligence that we know or we can know if we wish to 
that there are higher states and we can aspire to those states and we can work toward them. That's the process of yoga. Yoga means linking, linking the jivatma with the paramatma in the beginning. And finally, realization of Brahman. <laughs> That when the life energy comes to the Sahasrara, <laughs> you know, Amma, uh, Lalita, Ma, it, she's always guiding from within. If we simply listen, you know, all this, you think, you think that I sit down and memorize all this stuff? No, no. All this is directly perceived when you are in a state of enlightenment or meditation, yoga. See, when you're really merged with God, when you're so close, you know, the, the karma yoga is done at a distance from God. There's a distinction, there's a difference, there's a, a, a space or a distance between you and God. Bhakti comes a little closer because bhakti is about love of God. You know, only in jnana yoga do we actually identify with God. Aham brahmasmi. Now this is a very interesting sutra. Sutra means a highly abbreviated statement of, of transcendental truth. Aham means I am. Brahma, of course, means Brahman. And Asmi also means I am. So is it redundant? Not really. Because we are meant to interpret this by adding the requisite thought to connect Aham with Brahma Asmi. Okay? So here's how it should go. Aham, I am. Because I am, that means I'm conscious of my existence. And ultimately, I'm conscious of my consciousness. So being aware of awareness or conscious of consciousness is a quality of the nature of Brahman. Okay, so I am aware of my awareness, therefore, Brahmasmi, you see, I am, because I'm aware of my awareness and my beingness, I am Brahman. It's a syllogism. It's a logical statement. But you have to supply the missing context because it's a sutra. You see, Vedas... <laughs> Vedas are not meant to be read like ordinary books. You have to supply the missing ingredient, which is your own realization, your own uh, view that you gain not from logic, although the Jain logic is very interesting, so interesting, I think I'm going to do another video on it. <laughs> but from one's practice, from one's experience. And this realization will actually give us all the guidance we need. The guru is within because ahang brahmasmi, Brahma is there within us. We can contact that level of beingness. And from that point of view, everything is obvious. All we need is the openness and the ability to go deep enough into the silence to hear that still small voice. Om Tat Sat. Om Shakti Aum.